for things being a little bit late, but with um, traffic being blocked off downtown and things, we, we're getting started a little bit late. I'm Leilani King from uh, Native American Affairs from the Catholic Archdiocese in Seattle. Over on my left here, this is Shelly Means from Washington Association of Churches. We're helping convene this panel today in the absence of um, Tom Goldtooth and uh, Chris Peters from Seventh Generation Fund. On our panel today, we have uh, Chief Arthur Manuel from the Sushwap Tribe uh, from Camelops, PC. Welcome him, our honored guest. And also, um, Jeff Thomas, he's from the Puyallup Tribe in Tacoma, and he's uh, with Natural Resources there in Forestry. I'm going to give him a nice welcome. Now, we're just going to do this in a, um, a panel format and then maybe go to round table if there's uh, very few other people coming in. So now this. Uh, turn it over to Shelly Mees to describe to you about Seventh Generation Fund and the IEN, in Indigenous Environmental Network. Thanks. Sit down. Thank you. Um, okay, first I'm going to start by um, apologizing to all of you that, um, you know, at the end of this long and exhausting week, we don't have the turnout um, that we had hoped for from our panelists. In fact, we may still be joined by one more, and I may have um, talked a, a, a fourth person into joining our panel who has come today from um, Papua New Guinea. Um, and he's, he's in the coffee room right now deciding if um, he wants to join our panel or not. Um, so um, I'll, I'll describe real briefly for you um, what the um, Indigenous Environmental Network Seventh Generation Fund and the International Indian Treaty Council um, envisioned by bringing together this, a delegation here and bringing together these forums and, and kind of how we've been doing this week. Um, the International Indian Treaty Council is an organization that, um, well, I'll read from their little brochure just to cheat a little bit, um, working for the rights and recognition of indigenous peoples. Um, they, they have offices um, San Francisco, Palmer, Alaska, Minneapolis, Guatemala, um, and New York City. And they do a lot of work like this at the international level. Um, um, the declaration, draft declaration for indigenous peoples, um, the, um, a lot of sort of UN level um, involvement um, trying to bring indigenous leaders from their communities to these forums um, to defend our rights and um, to even at the basic level, just explain um, our cultural ties, um, our um, the importance and the sacredness of Mother Earth in the realm of international environmental law um, and human rights as well. I shouldn't I shouldn't leave that out. Um, Seventh Generation Fund is an Indian um, founded and Indian operated um, nonprofit foundation based in Arcata, California, and they do a tremendous amount of work in Indian country um, throughout this um, hemisphere, really, um, supporting traditional leaders um, as well as um, tribal government leaders who, who are engaging at this level um, internationally and federally, you know, testifying at Congress and that kind of thing. Uh, they raise money from other foundations to to put into um, Grassworks um, Native um, Environmental Work, and have done some very very important um, projects in our in our world. Um, the Indigenous Environmental Network is a, a broad network of of leaders um, in oh around it's North and Central and South America um, and. Uh, some Hawaiian, um, I know there's some um, Hawaiian involvement as well. And um, they do, um, again, important work in the environmental community. Um, and they do, they do things in a very traditional way. And, and um, um, one example that I like to share with people is that the, um, the annual conference for the Indigenous Environmental Network um, every year um, they, we, we bring people back to the earth. We don't go to the Sheraton Hotel. We don't go to um, retreat centers. We go, for example, this year in June, we were down at Laguna Pueblo, um, and the topic was uranium mining because the um, people at Laguna Pueblo in New Mexico um, 
once had to live with um, the largest uranium open pit mine is it on? Yeah. Um, in, in the world. And I think there are mines now that are bigger than that, and this mine is now closed. But you know, we had to drive past this mine. So it's like the environmental issue that, that we were there to talk about was very much present in the place that we were meeting. And you know, those kinds of connections, I think, are, are vital to all of our efforts to um, preserving the earth and preserving our human communities, um, as well as the four-legged and um, swimming creatures as well. Um, earlier this week, we had, um, we, we've been participating in the, the marches and the rallies um, that have been going on, and we've kind of been holding down a command station here and, um, you know, bringing in people from communities locally um, and connecting with other indigenous folks who maybe didn't come as part of the delegation and didn't know that, you know, we were trying to make a concerted effort to get the indigenous voice out there. Um, if, if you don't have a copy of it, there, there is a statement, a final um, statement that um, this delegation um, put together. Um, that they're, It's out on the, the table out in the front here. Um, and it, it states, you know, it, it declares it and, and includes some recommendations for the WTO um, of, of ways that, of things that need to be considered in this whole meeting and, and process of the World Trade Organization. Um, the, we, we've had a forum on Wednesday night of um, indigenous leaders from around the world and I, for those of you who are there, um, I hope you'll share some stories and some um, it, um, reflections on the value of that evening. I, we had probably 200 people um, at that gathering and, and I want to share with you um, a really important perspective that came out of that um, that particular forum, which was that um, we sort of naturally um, evolved towards, um, you know, appreciating the role of our young people in all of the things that are going on here um, relative to the World Trade Organization. You can bet that there are no young people inside as official delegates to the World Trade Organization, and. Um, the, the people that are there on the streets and the peaceful protests, I, I think um, our delegation and our elders specifically really expressed some deep and profound um, appreciation for, for their role. And um, you know that kind of leadership and that kind of support, I think, is something that that um, you know I, I personally am very proud of, and I think that um, that's our future. You know, that's our future, and. Um, so um, that forum, we talked a lot about the um, issues of biopiracy, of um, how the, the trade-related um, impacts of um, uh, intellectual property rights relate to um, real communities in South and Central America, and um, how you know, this constant struggle to keep corporations from digging huge pits through our communities and from taking huge, um, st all of our forests away, our ancient forests, and, and then just the, the knowledge of our um, medicines and traditional, traditional plant knowledge and earth knowledge. Um, we heard a lot of very eloquent people sort of telling each of their stories and um, you know, how the, the struggle of that has such a, a, an impact on our human communities as well. Um, on um, yesterday, was that Thursday? <laughs> um, we had a, a forum of elders um, who spoke to us, kind of reflected back um, to all of us, um, again, that, that basic um, knowledge brought down through the generations from our ancestors um, about the earth and why it's important um, to be doing the work that we're doing and why it's important to be here standing up in a, a huge um, melee like this um, to try to make our voices be heard. And, um, and they also um, spoke about the challenges of, of taking this international level of dialogue and of negotiation that goes on into our individual communities and, and how difficult it is when you've got, um, you know, there's some basic survival struggles going on in our communities and, um, and it's really hard to relate, you know, hungry people to the TRIPS Convention Article 219, you know, 
that kind of thing. It's really hard to find and develop and, and strengthen and support the kind of leadership um, that, that we need to be doing. And um, I'm hoping there'll be some reflection on that also from, from our panelists today. Um, and finally, we had a reception last night um, up at El Centro de la Raza. And um, it was a networking meeting as much as anything, you know, at first we'd envisioned it to be something where we'd go and we'd lobby certain delegates from, official delegates to the WTO to please come to our um, reception and hear firsthand what the indigenous issues are. And um, it sort of evolved into um, more of a networking meeting with other people of color who are here, um, you know, frustrated with what's happening, um, sharing, you know, what special knowledge each of us have about what's going on, you know, whether it be from the, the perspective of the rallies and the marches or and the human rights issues related to that, all the way through, um, you know, how do, how do we go away from this um, week, you know, resolved to um, stay together, understand our, all of our issues and, um, and, you know, truly make a difference at the next WTO meeting um, and, you know, and all the other international forums that are available to us. So um, just, I hope that was helpful, you know, to kind of set the context of this delegation. Um, the, um, the topic today that we're here to talk about is forestry and, um, of course, that's not an isolated thing. I'm sure we'll be hearing fish in this, um, fisheries, you know, in this part of the world, it's salmon. Um, We'll be hearing about um, medicines, I'm sure, and about um, clean water and its importance. Um, I think just to, to wrap up my part of this introduction, um, I want to share with you a, um, at the conference in New Mexico for the Indigenous Environmental Network last year, there was a gentleman from Guyana who um, is a tribal government leader. Um, he, he's on their tribal council. Um, he also... It, um, works a lot at the international level. So he's one of those, those leaders that I think we really need to um, you know, work hard to support. And so I, I think I'm kind of hoping to bring his spirit into this room by sharing a story that he told um, as he was, uh, he said the elders had taught him at a very young age that where there is, um, let me see if I can make sure to get this right. Um, where there are forests, there is water. Where there is water, there is food. Where there is food, there is health, and where there is health, there is wisdom. So I thank you all for starting an hour late with us and, and for coming here despite the attraction of that rally that's going on. And, and um, I want to also thank our speakers for being here and turn it over to them. Thank you. Oh. <clears throat> First of all, I'd like to uh, thank the uh, organizers of the, I guess, the Indigenous uh, yeah. People, People's Forum for inviting me here today to speak. Um, I'm the uh, chief of a community in South Central Interior called Nisconla, and uh, it's one of the Shushwap, one of the 17 Shushwap communities in South Central Interior. I'm also the chairman of the uh, Shushwap Nation Travel Council. I'm also uh, the spokesperson for the Interior Alliance, which is five uh, nations in the South Central Interior of uh, British Columbia. We produced this uh, document here, it's out in the hall, but it does give you a map of uh, British Columbia and it shows that the Central Interior Alliance is about around a quarter to, quarter to a third of uh, British Columbia in terms of territory. So it's a fairly substantial part of, of, of British Columbia. The people in the nation are the, the Shushwap uh, Nation is one of them, and the Okanagan Nation, the uh, Nakapmuk and the Statlium, and the Southern Carrier Nations, and those are made up of about around 45 different bands uh, or communities. Uh, I think it's important to, to understand that uh, forests are a very integral part of, of the, uh, the south central interior of uh, British Columbia. 
in that we do depend on them both from a historical point of view but also currently in terms of hunting and fishing and the fact that the forests are the habitat for, for all, all things and we depend on them a lot currently. So I think it's important to understand that. I think it's also very important to understand that uh, when we're talking about uh, Canada in particular, uh, you need to understand that uh, the area that I'm talking about in terms of the South Central Interior, the Interior Alliance area, we never signed treaties uh, with Canada. So we don't have a treaty or an agreement with the Canadian government at all. And uh, we've been struggling uh, with the issue of trying to develop some kind of uh, common relationship with regard to forest and other natural resources within our traditional territory based upon the fact that we don't have a treaty with the uh, Canadian government on those lands or the resources in that area. And I think it's important to understand that we've fought uh, with the Canadian government uh, through to the Supreme Court of Canada. And we've, we've had a number of decisions, like the Sparrow decision in regards to fisheries and, uh, and more recently the uh, Dalgamuk decision, which uh, Dalgamuk is the name of the family, traditional family that uh, amongst about 40 other families that took the, the, the uh, uh, Canadian government to court on the question of Aboriginal title. So Delgamuk is the name of the, the, the family name. So they call it the Delgamuk case in Canada. And that was decided on December 11th, 1997. And uh, basically that uh, Supreme Court of Canada decision decided that uh, Aboriginal title was a collective or is a collective proprietary interest of indigenous people who have not entered into any agreement or settlement with the Canadian government. So that covers the entire area of the Interior Alliance because we've never signed treaty with Canada. We still have a proprietary interest, a collective proprietary interest in the traditional territories, not just the reserves, but the entire Shushwap territory or the, the, the whole of the Okanagan territory or the whole of the Nakapmuk or Statlia, the whole of the area that's mapped out in, in this area, we have Aboriginal title too. The other thing that the Delgamuk decision does say is basically that the province of British Columbia has the right to infringe but not extinguish Aboriginal title. Furthermore, it says that under Section 35 of the Canadian Constitution, Canada cannot extinguish Aboriginal title either. So basically what it's saying is that <clears throat> we have a proprietary interest in lands and resources which include forests and include resources. And uh, we should be negotiating uh, with the Canadian government to reconcile Aboriginal title. But we aren't negotiating with the Canadian government simply because the Canadian government has uh, a policy that they developed in 1986 called the Comprehensive Land Claims Policy. And the purpose of that policy, because it was made in 86, was to seek surrender from us of our traditional territories and that they would give us back in return treaty rights. And we do not accept that. And we never did in 86, and so we've never participated in any, in any negotiations with the Canadian government. Because we believe that Aboriginal title under our territory, like the Supreme Court of Canada says, but we believe that before that, existed before the white people came over and settled in the area. And then the Supreme Court of Canada agrees with that. They said that Aboriginal title comes from the prior property right of Indigenous people. And that when Canada was formed in, in 1846, when the British government asserted sovereignty over that area, Aboriginal title crystallized as a proprietary interest. And it has been there since 1846. It's there today, and it can be there 10,000 years from now and it's a property interest that's there. So we look at Aboriginal title as an interest like in an onion 
is the bottom and the most base interest. And if there is white interest there, it's crown interest, but it, it is on a burden on top of the, of the aboriginal title interest, which means that every tree that grows, we have a property interest. Every blade of grass that grows, we have a property interest. Every ounce of water, we have a proprietary interest. And the whole purpose of negotiation is to settle that relationship and reconcile that relationship between uh, indigenous people and the white settlers. And so that's what Aboriginal title basically means to us. And one of the purposes that we <clears throat> feel is essential in, the, in dealing with the implementation of Aboriginal title is to come uh, up with agreements with the provincial and federal crown that would uh, enhance sustainable development of our traditional territories. Because those territories were given to us from our ancestors and from the Creator, and we feel that it is a, an appalling uh, type of uh, shame on, on people when they rape and pillage the land like they've been doing in the interior of British Columbia. And that we feel that we can use and marry Aboriginal title with sustainable development so that we can develop a strong alliance in, in, in using uh, Aboriginal title as a, as a strong foundation, or legal foundation, to push for sustainable development. In terms of the World Trade Organization and uh, the initiatives here on behalf of Canada, uh, we feel that Canada is misrepresenting their ownership of the forest and other economic resources, especially from our traditional territory. We feel that because there is no agreement with the Shuswap people, with the Okanagan, the Nakapmuk, and the Statlium, and the Southern Carrier people, we feel that Canada is misrepresenting themselves here in Seattle because they're not representing 100% ownership of lands and resources from our traditional territory because they only can get that authority from us and we have not consented to Canada having the authority to talk and talk and, and talk in terms of those lands and resources. In fact, we accuse Canada of stealing downright theft of all the resources that they've been taking from our traditional territory up to now. And it's a it's a decision uh, it's it's an opinion that we feel is supported even from their own Supreme Court in their own country. And so Canada has to, has to grow up. They have to start realizing that they can't continue trading on the international market until they deal with indigenous interests and issues and, and come up with settlements with us. And that, in that regard, we uh, published an advertisement in the Vancouver Sun stating basically the same kind of case that I've expressed here. And uh, since that time, we have uh, took a trip to, to New York City to meet with some uh, foundations in the United Nations, and we've also took a trip to Washington, D.C. to meet with people who are dealing with uh, environmental and sustainable development issues. We also uh, traveled throughout Europe uh, distributing this booklet and seeking support and developing the international market campaign against B.C. forest products based upon the fact that BC forest products are stolen products and shouldn't be negotiated for trade here in the United States or anywhere else in the world until the Canadian government sits down and talks to indigenous people about uh, sustainable development and managing the forests in South Central and Interior of British Columbia on a sustainable basis based upon the fact that our indigenous elders are the ones who have to participate and verify whether or not uh, wood products have been uh, uh, harvested on a sustainable basis. Like we've talked to the International Forest Stewardship Council, we talked to the BC Forest uh, Stewardship Council and the Canadian Forest Stewardship Council saying that indigenous people have to be the final say in determining whether or not for, uh, trees in the south central interior of British Columbia have been harvested according to sustainable development because we believe that it's through our indigenous knowledge of using the broad spectrum of our resources within our traditional territory that 
or is the knowledge that certification must be based on. Because you can't, you know, the guys from the University of British Columbia, sure, they might know something in terms of scientific kind of knowledge, but they're limited because they don't have to depend on the forest for medicines, for food, and berries, and hunting and fishing. They don't have to rely on it. My people still have to rely on hunting, fishing, and berry picking in our area simply because we've been pushed to the margins of the economic uh, uh, field in, in Canada. So, you know, we still need to hunt for a living. You know, people in my reserve uh, get $175 on social assistance, and we have up to 85% of our people unemployed. So you can't live on $175 down here. You can't live up there on $175 a month either. So you need to hunt. You need to fish. You need to pick berries. You have to rely on them. So we are the ones who are impacted by industrial forestry activities immediately when those trees start falling and the habitat of our, of our wildlife starts being destroyed. We're the ones that are impacted by that. So the thing is that we have a very strong case on current use and activities with regard to our, 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 our reliance on, on, on indigenous foods. And we also have that in terms of you know, the, the traditional knowledge of our elders in terms of the medicines and that. And so the thing is that we have to realize that traditional knowledge and sustainable development are very key elements that have to work together. And I think the marketplace within Canada, whether it be Home Depot, whether it be uh, with other hardware store or paper companies, all have to start being pressured by consumers uh, to, to take into consideration that wood products coming from the South Central Interior or from coming from Canada have to meet standards. I know, for instance, like in the uh, International Forest Stewardship Council, I think there's only 10% and I think of North America that are under certification and in Europe it's about 65%. But I think uh, you know there has to be a real uh, effort on the part of all people including everybody here to really put pressure on on the economy uh, to be able to start responding to these sustainable development issues. But anyways uh, I think it's important uh, all of these issues uh, need to be uh, addressed and I appreciate the, the time and effort uh, taken by everyone to, to, to listen. Thank you very much. Okay, our next panelist is Jeff Thomas from the Puyallup Tribe, Natural Resources. Jeff. Well, thank you very much. <clears throat> I uh, appreciate Alani and uh, others in the Indigenous Environmental Network for inviting me to participate on today's panel. Uh, in my work on behalf of the Puyallup Tribe, I certainly deal with forestry issues, maybe more as they relate to the local situation than the national or the global, but uh, I do have some views that I'd like to share with you and uh, really do want to inspire others to ensure that what is taking place here today does culminate in some type of call for action uh, without uh, a action outcome to our deliberations today uh, we're really just sharing information and probably speaking to the choir so uh, let's think about what that action outcome might be <clears throat> I'd like to commend the previous speaker for his insightful viewpoints on the significance of the forest ecosystems to the interior peoples of British Columbia. Uh, the Shuswap Nation is uh, a group who does have influence here in the s lower Puget Sound area. Uh, my family itself is, did have members of our dance group that were from Shuswap back in the 1960s. and. Uh, who knows, uh, maybe my new friend to the right here uh, may be familiar with them. But uh, we are all one big nation, and that international boundary uh, certainly wasn't put there by the native people of this area, and in that it continues or serves to be an obstacle to interaction between those groups, um, it uh, may be a, a general detriment as a whole. I, I would like to, on that, Note, maybe make mention of the Pacific Northwest Treaty, which is a recent effort of the later 1990s in which tribal or indigenous peoples of first the Canadian and 
Pacific Northwest uh, United States area started to try to work together on common issues and approaches for uh, furthering their common agenda needs. And I guess that that forum has evolved considerably over the last three or four years to pretty much include indigenous peoples from across the Pacific Rim, including Australia, as I understand it. Uh, that's a forum of which I've not had much involvement myself. Uh, to maybe clarify what I do and why I'm here, uh, again, my name is Jeffrey Thomas, and although I am a employee of the Puyallup Tribe of Indians, hailing from Pierce County, Washington State, I am actually a member of the Muckleshoot Tribe, the neighboring tribe who shares many of the waterways and ecological systems with the Puyallup, uh, as well as others further to the north, more uh, affiliated with the immediate, our immediate proximities here in the King County area. So I have a predilection for uh, fisheries and natural resource and forest ecosystem management issues as they do relate to the greater Seattle-Tacoma area and maybe more uh, pointedly upon the Mount Rainier forest ecosystem, including its uh, long-term significance uh, for the tribal community. Uh, with that being said, maybe I could just say a little bit more about my work and how I believe that it does have bearing uh, or, 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 and the connections that may be significant uh, between what it is that I'm doing and the issues being considered here in the Indigenous Peoples Forests and the World Trade Organization Forum. Uh, all in all, uh, I guess I noted uh, maybe half dozen or so topics that I would like to touch upon, and I'll, I'll just list them off for you here. I, I believe that there's issues that are a matter of scale to, to uh, sort through here, that the purpose of tribal government certainly has to be uh, contemplated, and that as well as that government's responsibility to advocate on behalf of their community for various needs, when it comes to various needs, issues, or solutions. Uh, I also believe that tribal cultural perspectives are key to this type of discussion, and uh, maybe emphasizing the imperatives relating to the management of forest ecosystems, as well as uh, specific approaches for addressing tribal cultural resource management needs. Then uh, I believe that it would be relative to or relevant to talk about deforestation and how that has impacted the Mount Rainier Indians over uh, since uh, over the period of your American contact then uh, I uh, also feel strongly about our responsibility and capability of speaking out on behalf of those who cannot speak for themselves uh, finally maybe some last thoughts might have to do with challenges and opportunities related to networking amongst ourselves and then uh, as well as the needs and opportunities for networking in the uh, Forum of Indigenous Forest Resource Management. Uh, I, I really did appreciate uh, <clears throat> my colleagues' uh, emphasis upon traditional ecological knowledge and sustainable development. I believe that those are uh, two pillars of a tribal natural resource management strategy and agenda of which very and insufficient use has been made very little insufficient or very little sufficient use has been made in the past so yeah let's do more TEK yeah let's do more sustainable development let's figure out how they fit into the things that we're all doing on a day-to-day -day level well uh, it could be I've already exceeded my time period in that case, uh, I'm not quite sure where I'd like to go. But in the event that there's a few more minutes... We're going till 4 o'clock. Okay, well, uh, at, at 2.30 they start towing my dance. car, so I'll have to keep that in mind. We'll let you go park your car. <laughs> but uh, personally, uh, it is nice to be back here on the Seattle University campus uh, where I've not had a chance to have a presence for at least the last 17 years uh, when over in that library room I was at that time studying bacteriology and hematology uh, uh, 
in my endeavors as a pre-med student. That's uh, maybe another time and another world ago. For the 1990s, I've pretty much been a forest ecosystem protection program officer on behalf of the Puyallup tribe, who s tribal history incontestably relates to the watersheds and, e and forest ecosystems associated with Mount Rainier and its greater environs. The Puyallup tribe and its neighboring tribal communities are the Mount Rainier Indians, and I uh, would imagine that uh, even in spite of the rather overcast weather we've had recently, that at some point in your day you've made notice of Mount Rainier and the beautiful forested ecosystem that uh, lies between that body and the saltwater shorelines just down the hill. I'll also point out that uh, we are in an area where it's quite likely that uh, almost 144 years ago, the native peoples were uh, conspiring on one side of the ancient forest ecosystem located probably right where we're at to cross over our, the hill and uh, make war with the Euro-Americans who had been establishing themselves in the Elliott Bay area uh, later to become uh, world-renowned as the community of Seattle. There was quite a few Indians, I guess, that went down there and raised some real heck with those guys that day. It lasted all day long and all night long. And uh, the end result was the burning of every settler's house outside of the greater Seattle community all the way probably to Tacoma beyond. The Indian people here have probably felt very strongly about their forest ecosystems uh, since time immemorial. And the attributes of that forest ecosystem are certainly of great concern to them today. When you take, think about your historical or, and or reference ecosystem that managers today might try to be, might, might um, recognize as a management objective, uh, you, it's hard to discount the fact that large wood, uh, huge ancient trees, or huge trees uh, representing a very ancient past were scattered and strewn very uh, prolifically uh, across all of the beach and stream riparian areas from the saltwater shoreline all the way to uh, the uh, upper alpine environments. There was lots of wood here. There was big wood here. There was big water here, and there was big fish here. Uh, with the ongoing impacts of the deforestation process, and I'll make note that although you may believe that you're seeing a forest when you walk outside this building today, somewhere within your uh, field of vision, it's most likely that that is not officially a forest because it resides, it is situated within the local government's urban growth boundary areas. And because of that, it is more likely to be acknowledged as a critical area to support some type of uh, plant, animal, fish, or shellfish species, a protected area, but certainly not a forest. The commercial forest land of Washington State sits outside of the urban growth boundaries. And in most part, is. Uh, uh, on the opposite side of a acknowledged mixed-use zone within any particular watershed. So the way a watershed's looked at when it comes to the Washington State area is it's very, especially in Lower Puget Sound, is you're probably looking at an urban growth area, a mixed-use area, and then a commercial forest land area. Today you hear talk about recovering the salmon within the tri-county region of this Lower Puget Sound, the uh, Snohomish King and Pierce County areas and the watersheds uh, sit situated thereof. The salmon, which in a former time, in fact, uh, up until maybe even the ending, of, uh, the termination of the last century, were uh, associated with a very hydrologically complex riverine system. The, uh, in fact, the bay down here in front of Tacoma is one at which uh, salmon could enter the river and then work its way through the river system all the way 
uh, down to, Tacoma, to the bay at Tacoma and then come back out in the salt water. So they could basically circle this whole area. And there's lots of rivers coming off of the mountains that those fish uh, stocks evolved um, within and thereof. And so there's some pretty complex ecology that characterizes the historical setting of this area. And along with deforestation and the simplification of those environmental settings has come very, very dire impacts upon local uh, plant, animal, fish, and shellfish representatives. In many places, you do not find the representatives of the forest ecosystem that certainly prevailed here for eons of time in the past. Now, we are quite concerned about extirpation uh, of especially aquatic fur-bearing animals. The, where are the river otters, the muskrats, the minks, the weasels, let alone the beavers that we know are supposed to be a part of our ecological systems in every freshwater stream? What about all of those forested wetland plants that just simply are no longer available for tribal community use or appreciation? Are we uh, supposed to foster a hope here within the homelands of the Puyallup tribe and the uh, beautiful Mount Rainier ecosystem that at some point we will once again see the restoration of the lowland old growth cedar forests, let alone the spruce? Uh, right now, we're battling for opportunity, restoration opportunity within the lower watershed of the Puyallup River because of its extensive channel, diking and channelization. Uh, the old Oxbow area is uh, representative of the former river channel that are now detached from the new straightened channel are, uh, for example, under great dispute as to their future potential for either one development and or two fisheries restoration, uh, habitat restoration possibilities. So there's a lot going on with the forest ecosystem in the, from a tribal perspective in the lower Puget Sound area. I, I've only talked about the lower watershed. I certainly haven't said anything about the, the upper watershed yet and the uh, efforts or aspirations of the local tribal governments to link the rules dictating, guiding, um, directing activity within the upper watershed with those found for the lower watershed areas, especially maybe under a common banner of recovering the local endangered salmon species. Uh, I would contend that when it comes to northern spotted owl, where people are focusing management attention today uh, uh, and the association of northern spotted owl or marble murrelets with uh, ancient, relatively ancient forest ecosystem areas, that that ancient forest ecosystem area, in fact, uh, existed all the way down to the saltwater shorelines in the historical setting. So when we're talking about recovery of northern spotted owl or marbled murrelet, why are we not talking about restoring the attributes of the lower watershed that fostered and supported those species as well? Probably that has a lot to do with political will. And then why are we studying the uh, the canopy arthropods of the ancient forest ecosystems on the Olympic National or the Olympic Peninsula if we don't in fact if we're not in fact entertaining some use of that information here within the ecological areas of the other side of the Puget Sound. I don't hear anybody saying let's restore those ancient forest ecosystems and get those former uh, or, and uh, relatively extirpated canopy uh, forest canopy arthropods back into place for their ecological benefits. So I, there's just a lot of things that do go along with uh, management of the forest ecosystem, identification of the issues. And you know, I, I tried to lay a template for some of these thoughts, um, I guess to just kind of say issues of scale. Certainly, um, you all, uh, many of you may have recognized, well, let's think about scale. What is global? Right now, there's a, today, in fact, a global messenger from Earth is expected to land upon the Martian soil and send information back. That's global. Versus local. A site specific, a project comes in that uh, is going to be evaluated for site specific impacts. But then again, maybe that has, uh, is um, the impacts uh, 
need to be considered at their larger sub-watershed or watershed scale. And that watershed scale may be in a basin or provincial scale, which then ties into a regional scale, which ties into a national scale, which ties into an international and I hope maybe global scale. So in that uh, you can connect or link those different scales of consideration in some way that's useful and constructive, then let's do it. Because it's, it's, it's the reality that we face. In that the world, or that the global free logging agreement could impact the environmental provisions that I make use of within my local sub-watershed setting, then I need to take interest in them. But in that, they're not providing guidance or uh, taking into consideration how things come together at those local, uh, relatively more local settings and situations, then maybe they need to take more interest and find out what are the tools that our people are making use of uh, in lieu of these larger, more global uh, opportunities. So I had not heard of this agreement. Uh, I certainly am not um, here to protest a policy on behalf of a tribal government, but in that I can relate to the issue and that I can bring the message back to the tribal government for the need to network with other individuals that know a lot more about these things and have actually convened upon our local setting in order to help reinforce that message, then we'll do that. Th then I will do just that and I'll bring it back to them and, and say, let's try to work with others who are as concerned about our home as we are ourselves. Uh, so I guess uh, let me just emphasize a couple things. Traditional ecological knowledge, you betcha. And if uh, you have a system for assessing your sub-watershed area, maybe one that emphasizes its physical features or its biological features or maybe even its social cultural features, make sure you've got traditional ecological knowledge and tribal perspectives and uh, you know, uh, maybe even more specifically participation and concurrence built into that assessment effort. It's th the result of that assessment that may in fact guide prescriptions that are developed for the local land use activities and in that that guidance is not in place, chances are or, or the f platform or forum for carrying the position uh, to the other co-managers is not in place, then you may have a shortcoming uh, a significant shortcoming that will affect your ability to achieve your change. But uh, with that, I, I guess I don't have a lot more to say other than maybe just keep rattling my way down my list. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I guess it's a good time for a break for questions. You want to take it? Uh, found, um, Foundation is always more than likely the answer. Of, uh, of harvesting in the forest and stuff like that. And people have to be really concerned about that because we're talking about the future. Uh, you know, when we talk about forests in, 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 in North America, we should be talking in terms of 500 years, not in terms of uh, how many cut blocks are out there, how many truckloads are out there, what's the payment of finning, what's the payment to the bank, and all this kind of stuff that sort of clutters the, and messes up you know, what we're talking about in terms of preserving force. And I think there has to be a serious discussion. And I think indigenous people are the people who have that old traditional knowledge and it has to be brought back in place. And uh, WTO has to be brought in line. And, and the thing is that we talk about ownership of land in terms of resources, traditional knowledge. And I think we have to put more emphasis on, on, on those issues. Thank you.
But uh, uh, I guess one of the problems with the U.S. delegates is when we talk to them, their first position is we did an environmental impact assessment of all these trade rules on forests, and it's not significant. Therefore, we're not really we don't have to talk about it anymore. But every day, the same thing happens. A group of people ask some questions. How is this going? Are you going to do the the trade liberalization? Who are you trying to make sign it? All this sort of stuff, and we haven't been getting any any answers. They won't tell us what specifically they're doing. Um, I mean, Canada's you know worse really than the Americans because all their products go to the, the states pretty much. But uh, so we were in a meeting and I and I said to them, have you thought about doing a social impact assessment of these trade rules? Because uh, frankly we don't agree with your environmental assessment because it uses a lot of faulty models. For instance, one thing they said was that forest um, production and or you know timber production in Canada would decrease by 4%. Well, I work in Manitoba, and every forest company there is planning on increasing by about 10%. So immediately, I'm thinking, your model is, is screwed up. So, and they said, no, we're not interested in the social assessment. Um, but I see, it seems like they have to tie this assessment to human rights and social issues or else it's meaningless. I mean, it's probably meaningless anyway, because, but there could be some pressure being put on the government. The forest activists, you know, speak a certain language and they're talking about very specific details, half of which I don't know what they're talking about, but uh, I, there does need to be more communication between the human rights and indigenous point of view and the environmental point of view which comes together in a lot of places. Um, mostly the pressure has been on the environmental side, and I think the indigenous side needs to step up a little bit more direct pressure on the government to look at the human rights and treaties issues, because it doesn't seem like they've even thought of the question yet. And that's all I have to show. Yes. Oh, I wanted to say something more to answer your question. Uh, some of us were at the Wednesday Night Indigenous Forum, and there were indigenous people from Mexico, Central and South America, and their issue is they live in the forests. And when it's more profitable for a company to come in and log, all of a sudden their homes are basically destroyed. They live in the forests, they fish in the rivers, and they basically are thrown off, off their land because it becomes more profitable for the multinational logging corporations to log because they don't have to pay tariffs anymore if the w WTO puts that through. So when it's more profitable for them, more indigenous people are thrown off their land and killed in some cases. I might have some follow-up thoughts on that uh, just to maybe clarify the experience that we are having at the level of local tribal government. The um, way in which decisions about the cutting of trees and logging in general will take place within our area is that whatever national or state rules may be in place will certainly serve as a sideboard to anybody's individual proposal and we're lo you're seeing lots of times adjustments to the regulatory provisions so in that there's a regulatory forum for addressing forest resource management it certainly has its expression at the local level that would be the northwest forest plan uh, which is a federal which is in the federal arena it would be provisions of the State Forest Practices Act in combination with those of the Washington State Timber, Fish, and Wildlife Agreement, which in its uh, non-regulatory provisions emphasizes meaningful relationships between tribal governments and proponents of land use, in this case, logging 
or forest industry. But for, the cutting of trees within our area is certainly not limited to forest industry. When we did an analysis of the types of forest practices that could be associated with the different sub-watershed areas of our tribal homeland area, we identified particular sub-watersheds where commercial forestry was very clearly the norm and the prevailing land use practice, where the only kind of applications that came in for that sub-watershed were ones that were of a commercial forest industrial nature. Whereas other sub-watershed areas were more associated with the removal of trees for conversion of the forest out of the forest land base into some other land use activity. So there's certainly some watersheds where conversion of the forest land base is the prevailing issue. Sometimes that comes in as rather benign, uh, seemingly insignificant proposals for tree removal that later on, uh, once occurred, find themselves resurfacing as new proposals for development. And they sure as heck are scattered throughout the individual uh, creek and drainage systems throughout our landscapes, especially the ones that aren't associated with major river bodies, but might more or less go straight into the uh, Puget Sound itself. They really fall through the cracks when it comes to ecological understanding or study. But the bottom line is that a tribal government, at least our tribal, the experience for our tribal government is that it does receive some notification of this land use proposal that's uh, expecting to uh, be in place somewhere within the tribal homeland area. So we've notified these appropriate agencies, federal, state, local, governmental, whatever, that when it comes to proposals for land use, we want copies of them. We want to be able to review them. We want to have an opportunity and a mechanism for responding to them and in most part trying to influence the conditions placed upon them. All to, um, let's see, all too typically they are, these proposals are approved. It's fairly rare for a proposal for, by some proponent to be completely disapproved, especially when it comes to forest practices. I think the disapproval rate's probably under 5%, probably closer to one. So most applications for logging or conduction of forest practices in our homeland, in the area of our homelands, are pretty much approved. So given that you know that that state forester or the forester serving that regional office of the State Department of Natural Resource System is going to approve most of the applications uh, because the proponents are familiar with the sideboards of the regulatory system and the things that they can or cannot propose and will in most part try to stay within the sideboards although clinging to the minimums and certainly drawing upon the shortcomings uh, um, inherent within the system itself such as weak regulations uh, um, unclear provisions uh, lack of uh, um, direct scientific foundation, and, or a questionable scientific foundation, I'll, I'll say. And so there's lots of ways in which the forest industry, you know, they got big groups of guys out there. We got a staff at our office of uh, five to ten biologists total for the tribe. I'm the only one focusing upon forest ecosystems and having to respond to all the proposals being submitted by, where, by Weyerhaeuser, Champion, Plum Creek, International, or I mean, Champion International, Plum Creek, just um, these big major industrial landowners that got land holdings other places, and they're always threatening us with leaving and uh, going somewhere else and selling their lands off. And we know that's probably not the threat that they make it to be. But at the same time, as you look at a map of the forest lands uh, uh, depicting the distribution of forest lands within our tribal homeland area over time, it's certainly getting less and less and less. And whereas today with those new provisions I talked about in the renegotiation of the agreement, there may be some opportunity for curtailing the trends of conversion. In other words, when we got forest industry to sign up to those provisions, and I'll point out that the Puyallup tribe did object to the final package and chose not to align themselves with the tribes who were 
considered uh, as its supporters. Uh, nonetheless, um, forest industry was uh, uh, was um, asked to make very you know make this a very long committing agreement and uh, that and so they can't necessarily jump their way out of it. Uh, just because they decided to convert those lands. And so whether or not you were tied to the agreement or not was certainly, and how long you some, a tribe could expect a group to, find it, to consider itself tied to the agreement was really important. But the reason that they renegotiated those rules was in order to respond to the recent listings of uh, uh, Northwest salmon as endangered by the, either the National Marine Fisheries Service or Fish and Wildlife Service uh, in the case of bull trout. So, they had very specific, you know, very strong incentives to work with tribes on trying to improve the regulatory package. But we didn't feel that it was improved to its best possible degree. There was lots of outstanding issues. They're still fighting big time disputing gang there over riparian areas and what will happen within the riparian buffers and how wide they'll be. And that's the upper watershed fight that I talked about. And we're doing the same darn thing in the lower watershed and the Tri-County Salmon Recovery discussions I talked about. And I also talked about trying to bring the two together, maybe underwater, and maybe through comprehensive land or basin planning. But again, the main point here is that somebody's proposing land use, somebody else is conditioning it. And in that, it's not on tribal lands, and the tribe does not have direct jurisdictional control over the conditions then it's going to be making every possible use of the regulatory, non-regulatory provisions, uh, including those of voluntary and cooperative approaches. And so in that we can somehow shape their land use proposal based upon the considerations, the direct considerations of protecting water, fish, wildlife, or cultural resource quality, then that's our avenue for getting the, that's our avenue for lessening the impact of the proposal in that they are not strong enough to completely uh, to, to lead to a complete disapproval of a proposal, then we can't, th then we just, then we may simply not be able to go there. And that may be the case, and that may be um, our uh, um, optimal and, and uh, or our optimally desirable objective is to just eliminate land use, or at least irresponsible land use, as it relates to forest ecosystems within our tribal homeland area, then we want to do that. But in that, the regulatory system and uh, jurisdictional framework doesn't allow us to be in the lead of that and to completely dictate its nature, then we have to do everything we can to try to respond constructively to these proposals for land use and can see that they're conditioned in a way that at least does not foster, facilitate, or um, otherwise lead to further environmental degradation and if at all possible has a restoration component kind of very clearly attached to it. But that's kind of how land use plays out. So if uh, this global, if the implication, the, the repercussions of a new policy, international policy saying that uh, either those things no longer have merit within our local area, then we're going to be real concerned. And in that, they seem to dis, um, absolve themselves of associations with reserved treaty rights, uh, long held near and dear by at least the Puyallup tribal government. You can bet that they'll be trying to, that they'll want to step forward as well. But I, I, I'm not going to try to make. Other than that, that's probably about the only governmental statement that I would make is that uh, I can't see Puyallup as. Um, idly observing a deterioration of reserved rights related to the Madison Creek Treaty. No, that's not where they're going to go. I guess we have a question over here. Yes. Um, are you concerned that uh, these treaties and provisions can be challenged as unfair trade practices under the WTO? Well, it seems like, you know, with uh, the... Um, congressional filter to, abro to, to, to treaty right abrogation, it, it would seem like that would be a pretty far leap uh, of faith to, to say that one could necessarily lead to the other. 
but in that somehow there's some influencing national policy now that really could uh, alter the the fundamental views arising from within the congressional body, then yeah, it would certainly seem to need further deliberation and follow-up. Are you trying to address uh, no ban on bans, or? Um, I'm just saying that, you know, the WTO um, has provisions, you know, where uh, other nations can, other nations, uh, uh, corporations can use other nations to challenge, you know, uh, all our environmental regulations, you know, and that includes uh, treaty provisions and also uh, agreements, you know, that we've worked out, you know, uh, to protect our forests. Right. Um. Uh, it, it was good to hear that my friend from Shuswap, uh, who does come from Canada, which is an entirely different uh, circumstantial and uh, governmental setting. I can't ask for him to speak to the things that go on here in the uh, United States itself. Uh, I would have hoped that Tom Goldtooth or Chaz or maybe Chris would have been here so that I could find out from them how their efforts are somehow aligning with things that are of a more tribal governmental orientation, for example, maybe with the National Congress of American Indians or the affiliated tribes of Northwest Indians not to mention a variety of other national organizations. Uh, I, I always liked IEN because of its grassroots underpinnings. Uh, but there's also Keepers of the Treasures, the National Tribal Cultural Preservation Council. Um, there's Society for Ecological Restoration with its Indigenous Peoples Restoration Network, uh, most um, often spearheaded by Dennis Martinez. There's uh, certainly uh, Society for Ecosystem Health or International Society for Ecological Economics. And as I say, there's a Pacific Northwest Treaty. All those things you would hope had some position on something of this nature, this scope and magnitude. And uh, given that information might, uh, regarding positions on this topic might be available through them or for them, that uh, certainly I'd want to be taking a look at that before I just jump to the immediate assumption that nothing was taking place uh, um, on the tribal level other than the uh, good work spearheaded here by the Indigenous Environmental Network and Seventh Generation Plan. I think it's, uh, it's definitely an issue that would concern uh, people in uh, Canada uh, that do have uh, treaties with the federal government. Uh, that those treaties would be used uh, uh, to undermine their their um, I guess their legal interests created by by those treaties uh, because they do involve the uh, proprietary uh, interests of indigenous people uh, as it uh, was before Europeans came over so the thing is that there is proprietary interest with with regard to those of us who don't have treaties with the with the settlers uh, in Canada, we we believe we have a property interest in the land itself and in the resources. And their court actually agrees that we have a property interest in the in the resources. And uh, one of the things that uh, I guess is a fundamental. Uh, reason why we aren't negotiating with the Canadian government right now with regard to our land rights is because their policy believes in the a land selection process and the land selection process is where uh, the settlers say well you Indians can have a reservation and we'll keep the rest you know you can become poor on the reserve and we'll become wealthy owning the rest and we feel that it is a fundamental uh, violation of our human rights to be asking us to do that. You know, they've done that in the past. Basically, Indian settlements throughout North America have been based upon the land selection process. The last 500 years, let's put it that way, has been based upon that. And we don't agree with that. 
And I think it's really a question of whether or not the settlers have matured enough to understand that we need to be able to share those resources so that the human rights of indigenous people are also valued, so that we have a, uh, access to our traditional territories, so that we can also enjoy the wealth and benefit that the Creator gave us. And the thing is, is that we look at the, that as a fundamental key human rights issue. And uh, part of that is then again linked to sustainable development from the point of view that we believe that uh, it's only through working with the people from the level where they are, which means we still do hunt, we still do fish, we still do gather berries and medicines from the traditional territories. And we have research to back us up on those areas because we've done that in, in preparation for legal cases against the Crown. But we believe that all of these things is to force the settler governments in British Columbia and Canada to, to recognize that the land selection process is not uh, valid because of human rights. You know, I heard the other day, and when I was in Geneva, talking about world trade and all the other things, the World Bank representative said that the poverty of indigenous peoples is a violation of their human rights. And I also heard the, the representative from the World Bank say that again in the uh, United Nations when they had the fifth anniversary of the decade of indigenous people. They had a report, and that was one of the statements they made. And I, you know, I think that the, you know, the poverty of indigenous peoples is, is very clearly integrated into, into the fact that we don't have a say in 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 the environment, in the economy of, of, of our traditional territories. And I think the North American settler has to has to mature. Has to has to start saying, okay, let's sit down and let's start trying to discuss these issues fairly. So I think people like this World Trade Organization is really where you got the corporate executives who really have no feeling except for profit, trying to take control of issues that I think are fundamentally relationships that us human beings have to start settling. And I think we need to put them in their place. relationship between treaties and the, the WTO, um, he made the point um, that, you know, in, in our country here in the United States, that um, the treaties are, you know, have been sort of taken or proclaimed in our, in our Constitution, in our Supreme Court and everything as the supreme law of the land, and that, um, you know, Congress is the only, because only Congress can abrogate um, a treaty and that kind of thing, but that um, what the WTO allows is for our um, U.S. government to walk into an international forum like that and completely ignore, sidestep, ignore um, the, the treaties that are, are valid under our Constitution. And so, um, you know, they don't have to represent our interests. They won't listen. I know that National Congress of America did, um, you know, has been trying to get leadership um, in our federal government, you know, aware of the importance um, of the government to government level of, of having um, indigenous representatives uh, at the table. And, you know, it goes nowhere because they believe that um, they are representing our interests and they're ignoring the, the basic, you know, relationships set up by these treaties. And um, I think that's a very Yeah, um, that reminds me of the secretarial order for implementation of the Endangered Species Act, the one that links the tribes with the administration of the act and the protection of endangered species, uh, as well as their recovery. Clearly, uh, Native people are not in a dominant situation in any governmental system any longer. And in that, uh, the dominant governmental system has an avenue for 
the minority, the relatively minority tribal governmental systems to make themselves heard or express their views, then it's there to, to be made use of. But that effort to which I'd earlier, the, the Secretary of Order, which um, I previously referred to, was put in place because tribes were concerned that as federal agencies went about administering the Endangered Species Act, it could have, uh, it could miss the mark on a couple of fronts. One would be that it would have, it would impose undue hardship upon tribal communities in its implementation. Maybe conservation, uh, putting fishermen on the banks uh, as they went about conserving a fish stock when it wasn't that tribal community that had depleted the stock itself. Or there um, may be relative shortcomings or uh, insufficiencies in the objectives that the federal managers were attempting to meet, uh, especially as it related to a local tribal, the, the agenda of a local tribal government. And so they, because of these troubling things about the Endangered Species Act, tribes convened maybe nationwide, certainly here in the Puget Sound on a couple of occasions, uh, in Western Washington, to talk about what they felt they still needed when it came to implementation of the Endangered Species Act in the way that, and the relationship it had with the tribal government. That culminated at, uh, in, I believe, 97, maybe it was 98, July, I'm going to say 97, in uh, the Secretarial Order number 3206, I believe, which is entitled American Indian Tribes, uh, or sec let's see, and Administration of the Endangered Species Act or something like that. But it laid out a very constructive framework for seeing individual, individual tribes engaged by individual federal agencies as they went about it, trying to administer the act and figure out where tribes fit into the picture. Empowering tribal government for, uh, to co-manage the endangered species of concern within its homeland area. Well, they even went to that even, so that the, the order came out, then okay, well there's a lot of implementation issues associated with this general language, let's hammer that out, start doing that in Portland, a couple hundred miles down the road here, and they start producing meaningful packages that then encountered roadblocks back in Washington, D.C. Funding for tribes and other efforts here in Washington State was, uh, came under threat um, should they move ahead that implementation package. So tribes are now lingering in our area with the need for this specific implementation language upon which they can act as tribal government and uh, maybe even pursue positive change as tribal government uh, in lieu of the uh, uh, acceptance or approval of that implementation package. So right now it's just in limbo. We know it's out there, but so that we've got the order out there saying we should be engaged, we should be involved, we should be accommodated, and yet when it comes to how you might go about doing that, we can't get any acceptance for the package. So uh, they're waving it all over the place saying it's a great thing, it's a wonderful thing for tribal government, they should all be happy about it. But yet when we get down to the particulars and the specifics and the details of making it work, there's nothing there to to draw from, and so it's not much that different than business as usual. But that's an example of how you can get tribal government to rally around an issue and take it all the way to D.C. and create change just to have it come back and kind of drop dead at the door. And uh, that's certainly something we all need to uh, uh, work together to strategize around. And, uh, and so I guess that's kind of my closing theme is that should something come together, the action outcome that I had re referred to in my opening comments, uh, I'd certainly be interested in what that was and do whatever I felt was appropriate for trying to move that endeavor forward. But, but they're probably about ready to, they're probably hooking up my car about now, so <laughs> maybe I should just uh, go ahead and make my departure. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.
We do have a call in to Chaz Wheelock to come back up from the rally. Oh, really? So. Well, if I know this spot, I'll be back. <clears throat> if I know this spot, I'll be back. Okay. No, I parked on the street in the two-hour spot. And just got to oh, because there's there. meters up on Broadway. I'm going to meter right up the block here. Yeah. And there were lots of meters up there. So. I, want, I want to read from the um, environmental, um, Indigenous Environmental Network's um, statement. Um, <clears throat> here's the orange one that's out. I'm going to read from that last because it's kind of a summary. And here's a, a white paper one that's a little bit longer, Indigenous Peoples Seattle Declaration um, Recommendations. And they have some um, direct statements about the WTO and what they are currently planning. The WTO this year is setting their agenda for the next 10 years. And that's why this one is more important than any other. You didn't exactly hear about last year's in a big way. Um, in some cases, they're setting an the agenda for 20 years. Um, so I'll just read directly from this. The WTO Forest Products Agreement promotes free trade in forest products by eliminating developed uh, country tariffs on wood products by the year 2000 and developing country uh, tariffs by um, the year 2003. The agreement will result in the deforestation of many of the world's, world's ecosystems in which indigenous peoples live. <clears throat> and we also just made, we already made mention what kind of um, effect that would have on the globe, um, global condition. Mining laws in many countries are being changed to allow free entry of foreign mining uh, corporations to enable them to buy and own land minerals and to freely displace indigenous peoples from their industrial territories. An example of this is uh, someone mentioned to me that the Asians are now negotiating to try to, um, to buy Lake Superior. Now, and this is not necessarily held by indigenous peoples anymore, but that was a little bit shocking to me. Um, these large-scale commercial mining and oil uh, extrigation uh, activities continue to uh, degrade our lands and fragile ecosystem and pollute the soil, water, and oil of our communities. <clears throat> the appropriation of our lands and resources in the aggressive promotion of commercialist and individualist, individualistic Western cultural culture continues to destroy traditional lifestyles and culture. The result is not only environmental degradation, but also ill health, alienation, and high levels of stress manifested in high rates of alcoholism and suicide. The theft and patenting of our biogenes resources is facilitated by the TRIPS, T-R-I-P-S, trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights of the TWO. Some plants which indigenous peoples have discovered, cultivated, and used for food, medicine, and for uh, sacred ritual practice are already patented by the U.S., Japan, and Europe. Our access and control over our biological destiny and control over our traditional knowledge and intellectual heritage is also um, threatened by trips. Now, this is a, a statement from indigenous um, environmental networks. Um, it isn't about trade and economic development. It goes beyond that, said Tom Goldtooth, coordinator of Minnesota-based Indigenous Environmental Network. We have grave concerns regarding the free trade and its impact on the environment, food safety, and our treaty rights. The rights of all people to have a say in their destiny must be respected. We're concerned over the domination provided to corporations by the, TW, by the WTO that commodifies our water, forest, our genes, and the theft of intellectual property. Beings 
and other creatures and, and resources, what have you, the plants, animals, are economic resources, period. The other is that there is a life that we all share, which can be a great value. The first one that says all, all economics, you lose the ability to feel. Everything becomes expendable. It just goes down and down and down. On the other side is what brings the spirit up. It builds communities, it builds strength of people where you're glad to be in a place. Okay. There's a four-step problem-solving uh, strategy, which I learned many years ago, which works very well when you're dealing with community garbage collection, uh, when you're dealing with human rights, uh, students' rights, uh, whatever you're dealing with, whether it's medicine, the first thing you need to do is what exists now. And this is a step which is usually missed. Usually people start out with step two, is what do we want to achieve? If you don't know what exists now in terms of all of the actors, their points of view, their strategies, their effects of the actions, their goals and what have you, you're flying blind. You're going to fail every time. You may fail 90% of the time anyway, but at least you have a fighting chance if you know what you're up against. Second thing is, what are your long-term and short-term goals? The long-term goal is to save, you, to save the planet and the people on it and to bring things up instead of going down. Okay, but there are a lot of short-term goals. How do we have to, what do we have to do here and here and here in order to try and get this thing going? The third thing is, what are the strategies for getting there and the resources? What do we have in terms of money? What do we have in terms of people who know stuff in geography, in contacts? And the fourth thing is we put it into practice and try it and then we'll learn and review and try and figure out what is, what is, what is working and what is not. One of the things that I find very, very important and we have not done as much as we could have done, and I, this was pointed out to me some time ago, is to create a climate of opinion. The climate of opinion we basically have now is, is governed by the media and it basically says take more and more and you have a right to have yours and Never mind anybody who gets in your way. We need to change the climate of opinion because until we change the climate of opinion, we're not going to get very far. And Indian people have been losing these battles for the last 500 years. I hate to tell you how many people we've lost. We've lost 100 million at least in the first 200 years in this country. And that's not my statistics, that's somebody else's. And it's real. We've lost a lot of forests. We lost a lot of our. We're losing what 75 varieties of plants a day in this on this earth. It can't go on. We have 7,000 square miles of ocean that don't have enough oxygen to, to take care of any kind of living creatures in the, in the oceans. People don't know this. We have to create a climate of opinion that this is in our best advantage. To, I don't care what your religion is, your race is, your ethnicity, or the rest of it. It doesn't matter. What's important is, what do we have to do to survive? And, and this needs to be made a common goal for everybody. And I think this old lady said too much, but thanks for listening. We have an honored guest from the um Chippewa Ojibwe Nation, and her, uh, is it your nephew that was here earlier today? Rick. Yes. He's down at the rally right now, but he made a statement um, about U.S. Um, forestry's um, situation, that the, the U.S. national U.S. forests were originally set up as a trust for um, indigenous peoples, uh, First Nation Native Americans. And that that has somehow gone by the wayside, and that um, currently they have no say, and certainly no profit or benefit from the use of those lands. That's something, of course, that should uh, be looked at, and that's with that's under a, a treaty. <laughs> we have a treaty. <laughs> They're just not looking at that right at the moment. That was really a significant statement for me, and something to be looking into, and certainly having a voice in eventually, hopefully. Um, I read a statistic when I was looking at the history of um, 
Native Americans researching something for a, for a class <clears throat> that I was going to give a, a statement to. And when European Americans originally came here, there was something like 60 million buffalo. This is kind of an ancient history, not something current right now, but it's just an example on how a species can be destroyed. <clears throat> I don't know if you have any idea what uh, 60 million animals are like, but the plains used to be, when they would do their migrations, the plains would rumble. There was such multitude and such, it was so plentiful that you didn't necessarily have to ride horseback and, and shoot one with the arrow or a spirit. Um, because Native Americans didn't have horses until um, um, the Spanish came. They traveled on foot, they carried um, everything in their belongings with dogs, etc. And um, you kind of just had to camp your site in the migration route and be able to huck a spear real good. And mostly it was a problem of trying to get the fattest one, not just getting one. Those numbers were reduced in a matter of 40 years to 550 animals. Now that is a horrible shame from 60 million to 550 individuals. I'd like to make a suggestion to the group and um, sort of ask permission of former guest, um, Chief Arthur Manuel and um, from our elder. Um, I, I guess I'd like to suggest that um, maybe we, we break from this kind of forum and, and even maybe move into the other room that you know, folks can have a copy of that and, and kind of change, change this from sitting up front and, you know, this kind of thing to, to more of a, a round table and conversation. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if our elder has anything um, would you like to add to the discussion? Or? Okay, well, let's move on back to We have a little I think, refreshment. You know, I think if we hang out for a little while together, um, more of our delegation will come back from the rally. I'm assuming that there's no tear gas. I want you to understand that I did not plan the WTO, nor am I affiliated with any group making plans for WTO. Last week on Tuesday, I was gassed while I was on my way to work. And again, Tuesday evening, I was gassed in the Capitol Hill neighborhood where I live. On Wednesday in the morning, seeing news reports, I decided that I would copy make a Xerox copy of a New York Times op-ed article that was critical of WTO. I was arrested while walking on a downtown pedestrian sidewalk. The arrest took place immediately after I handed a Xerox copy of this New York Times op-ed article to another pedestrian. I asked the arresting officer whether I was being arrested because I had handed out the article, but I was told no. I was arrested because I was, quote, in possession of the article while inside the no-protest zone. <clears throat> I asked the officer what I was being charged with, and I was told that the police would, quote, have to look it up. After 36 hours in jail, I was arraigned with the charge, failure to disperse. This law applies only to groups of three or more acting in concert. I was jailed and charged even though I had been walking peacefully, alone, and unaccompanied. In the arresting officer's opinion, I was committing a crime merely by holding a dissenting opinion within the no protest zone. 
It certainly is disturbing when an officer of the law expresses such blatant ignorance of the U.S. Constitution and the laws of our state. However, it is far more troubling to remember that the policy position taken by Mayor Schell and Attorney Mark Sidron motivated the outrageous actions so many of us personally experienced this past week. Mayor Schell offered leadership by slogan when he created the no protest zone. He curtailed our First Amendment liberties in response to the inconvenience suffered by WTO delegates. While the imposition of martial law as a means to ensure business as usual veneer for the benefit of the WTO conference attendees might be applauded by a totalitarian state, I believe we in Seattle deserve to have a mayor and city attorney who have a firmer grasp of the Bill of Rights and what it actually means to be an American citizen. Hello. I'm no longer a citizen of Seattle. I live in Taquila. Uh, I live in Taquila since 1989, and my ex-husband used to be on the council in Taquila, and I was very involved in the community. I'm 46 years old. I was arrested in Taquila twice. Uh, I was arrested uh, after I went to the police department to complain about the behavior of an officer, and it took 15 months for me to go to trial, and a lot of money, and I was found not guilty. Then I was arrested again in October 29, 98, when I was in my house working on my door, when I heard a screaming at night, and I went out, and there was a, a person on the street with officers around him, and one officer had a knee on the guy's neck. Uh, I told the officers you were hurting the guy, and they told me to move back, I moved back. The guy screamed, I looked closely, and I saw the guy in handcuffs, and I said to the officers, you can do that, you are hurting him, and I was arrested, spent the night in jail in Kent. I was not allowed my medication, I was not allowed to go to the bathroom, I was sit down in a chair. Uh, I was there from 8.30 at night, I was arrested in Taquila. Two in the morning I was sent to the Kent. Eight in the morning I was let go, and I was charged with the Southern Justice. The reason I'm bringing that to you is that I had to spend I, I, I spent about $6,000 so far. I had to stop school. I owe $3,000 to my lawyer, and I still haven't gone. I still have to go to trial again. So I have one trial. I was found not guilty. The second trial, it took four times to go to trial. Every time something happens, I went to trial the first, the, for the second a, a full day trial, my second trial. The officer approached the jurors while they were deliberating, so there was a mistrial. Um, I had gotten together with a bunch of people who had been arrested in Taquila, and, and we all had experience that the chi Chief Haynes does not want, does not do anything. Everybody who files a complaint gets charged. Um, they, I, I spent a year trying to go to trial for the second case, and what I'm hearing from other people going to trial is that it is very, very expensive because I'm on disability, but I make it just enough money not to qualify for free legal aid. But at this point, I'm four months behind on my mortgage payments while I'm defending myself. And I saw the police. I couldn't come to Seattle because I'm traumatized when I see police. And I, 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 I know that when I talked to other police officers in Seattle, they told me they know about Taquila police, and I'm, con I'm surprised that Seattle will allow Taquila police, with the reputation they have, to come to Seattle. And I will... <laughs> and I'm very lonely in Taquila. I, 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 I would like to be part of Seattle because in Taquila we don't have these people. People are sleeping over there. They think the police are great. I thought that way myself. My son wanted to be a police officer. I wanted, I was all for it. I even talked to Chief Haynes two years ago about my son being a police officer. So what I'm saying here is that Chief Haynes, in, in the article, in the thing, he says, I have to read this. Taquila Chief Haynes said yesterday that Seattle police will not take part in the investigation of the officer who has been suspended from SWAT duties, but not active duty, okay? 
Uh, Haynes also said he wanted to find out from Seattle police what the department's order were last week for a Taquila officer who came to assist. Mm -hmm. Now, this is, is what's been going in Taquila. Um, you, I, everybody who files charges files a complaint gets charged. I didn't file a complaint. I told the mayor, the city council, and they, everybody knows what happened to me, and I'm still going to trial and for a third time. And what I'm saying is that I need to know the names of those officers who, are, who came to, the, to Seattle because, and I would like, um, because in, in, in Taquila you cannot get those names. The judge won't give them to you. The, no, so I need them for myself because we, we, we need those names. And uh, I never again invite Taquila to Seattle. And I wish I, was, I belong to Seattle because I will have more support to my situation. Thank you. <laughs> Next. No, then Russ Peterson, then Alton McDonald, then Phil Lindsay is 126. Hi, my name is Sally Ann Hendren. Um, I just want to leave you with some imagery um, that actually narrates some of the photo, uh, the personal video, the private video you saw. The, pe the silent protesters, and this haunts me to this day. I'm kind of glad you got to see part of this. The peaceful, nonviolent protesters that are sitting on the ground that you saw gassed, I also saw beat. And they weren't doing anything, but my point, the image that I'm leaving you with, is two police officers, immediately after they beat the protesters and uh, sprayed them, gassed them, patted each other on the back. And I know there were a lot of photos taken of that, and I'd like to see them surface, if anyone. Um, there was a lot of people there, not a lot of the um, big time media, but since it's about time for 10 o'clock news, hello, um, yeah, these two officers patting each other on the back. That's really disturbing, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is uh, Paul Leto. I'm an area attorney. I employ another attorney and a paralegal. I was uh, concussion bombed and, and gassed on Tuesday. Um, my history is that um, the only other time I've been in or near the streets of Seattle to dem you know, involved in a demonstration or near a demonstration was actually in support of the troops during the Gulf War. So I can't claim uh, perfect pacifist credentials, and I've also uh, had some experience in being around law enforcement people because I worked in Yellowstone uh, very closely with law enforcement rangers there in Yellowstone. So I just want to say that I think I understand the uh, support the troops or support the uh, police officer um, idea. However, I'm very concerned about what's going to happen with all of the extremely powerful and truthful testimony that we've heard today about intentional assault, about torture, about miscarriages, all these things. Because it's not coming out in the media, and there's going to be a real tendency for this to be covered as well. In the chaos of the situation, you know, sometimes things happen. And that is not what happened here. If I, as a litigation attorney, defended my client on assault charges by saying that my client had a hard, stressful job with many tense, chaotic moments, very stressful, I would be laughed out of court. The prosecutor would probably savage me and, and call this the latest Twinkie defense. And yet, what are people saying to excuse the police brutality but these very same things? It was a tense, chaotic situation. They had the immediacy to deal with. This is a Twinkie defense, and it should not stand. <clears throat> My biggest concern is that uh, all the progress made under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights may go away. And by progress, I mean torture still happened, but it was done in secret, and every government in the world denied it. Well, we have the prospect here in the United States is that torture happens, it's reported in the papers, and the people love it, and they say, we support you. You showed great restraint. This is an incredibly disturbing prospect. 
that these allegations would not be dealt with, and I hope they are dealt with. And I hope that you, the people that listen to this can understand that the next time somebody in the media says the police officer showed, officers showed great restraint, they will understand why somebody might get in their face and be a little upset. And then somebody will understand that the next time somebody refers to violent demonstrations, they can understand why somebody gets in their face and gets real upset because of the false way it paints it and the fact that it ignores the fact that there was no property damage until after the police started gassing at 10 a.m. Is, is Russ Peterson here? Russ Peterson? Russ Peterson will be followed by Alton McDonald, Phil Lindsay, David McGraw, Jerry Knight. Jerry Knight is number 128. Hi, my name is Russ, and uh, I'm new to Seattle. I just came down from Alaska a while back, and this is, uh, there's more people in this room than some towns that I've lived in, so this whole thing was really amazing to me. Um, and I went down to take some pictures and got... Uh, activities were originally in place, so the tribes in 87, they made an agreement with Washington State, including the forest industry and environmental groups to develop a new system for where everybody got a chance to evaluate logging proposals in any local area. The um, five goals of the Timber, Fish, and Wildlife Agreement of Washington State, which is still in place, but yet, but has yet had some renegotiated terms as of last year, and they're still coming to finalization, lists timber viability, the viability of the agreement. So in that, it is one of the five, fi uh, five fingers of the hand of TFW, and the others being protection of water, fisheries, wildlife, and cultural resources, then certainly by economic issues relating to timber industry have bearing to, upon tribes within Washington State and the decisions relating to management of forest resources. Uh, we have agreed to support the viability of the timber industry uh, as uh, tribal entities. But what does that mean? Nobody's really ever dove into what does that mean, in most part because industry is pretty much covering their end of things. Uh, in the face of our consistent and persistent endeavors to improve protection of water, fish, um, wildlife, and cultural resources. So what I'm trying to point out is that we've not had that many discussions on viability of timber industry or economics related to timber industry as tribal governmental entities that I'm aware of. And I, I, I would think I would know about them. Uh, and I think that that's probably something that this, that the indigenous, that IEN or, or others here that are trying to uh, facilitate change and interest at a local level need to take um, notice of to look at to maybe acknowledge recognize that the Washington State at least the tribes of Washington State don't have any uh, do, are lacking the significant inroads into this discussion topic that they may need and so for me now so what that would mean is that I need to start figuring out what does make the industry viable within my local area and how do my resources affected by that The WTO itself, I would have to ask their delegate. Yeah. This handout here kind of specifically addresses, of course, from our point of view, um, what's going on with the WTO. And I'd like to read a little bit <clears throat> um, from this here. On the, on the second page, uh, you see um, WTO poses a threat to our forests. The other front page um, addresses our water, our air, our food. So I'm just going to read from our forest. Excessive logging that the TWO may exacerbate um, global deforestation. Um, currently, there's only one fifth of the world's forest left. Um, and I don't know how much you remember from your high school biology. Um, they deforest the globe. We're dinosaurs. There's no more exchange of carbon dioxide to oxygen. Um, actually, my father's a marine biologist, and there's one other thing that we can do. There's two pinnacle things that we can do to e turn ourselves into dinosaurs. One, cut off all the forests, no more exchange from carbon dioxide to, to oxygen. 
and the top layer of the ocean, the plankton, that's there. That's the bottom of the food chain. We uh, toxify our oceans to that point, we're out of it. So um, this, this exacerbated global deforestation is very important because uh, rainforests are a key in exchanging of carbon dioxide to oxygen. There are plans to negotiate free trade agreements in forest products. This is going to turn this into a global economy. It does it, it, does it now, but it just means that the whole um, process is going to be accelerated. The exchange of money, that you think global cor corporations are a problem now, is, is going to be extremely exacerbated. Um, it talks about consumer choice, echo-labeling. Echo um, that goes to Chief Arthur's, uh, Arthur's um, manual statement about um, responsible, sustainable development uh, of forests and the use of it. Um, protection of species, um, Jeff Thomas just mentioned that in the canopy of the forest and uh, the animals and other types of creatures that are supported by that. So if you want to pick that up at the front, you can read in a little more detail. <clears throat> yeah, that's the main reason I'm down here is because the, the World Trade Organization is trying to, I guess, <clears throat> harness the environmental movement and harness uh, any certification type of initiatives. And uh, they're trying to do that under the auspices of uh, the trade agreements are uh, more important than uh, than uh, the environment. I think it's very important to understand that uh, in international relationships, uh, the United Nations at one time was pretty significant from the point of view that it dealt with human rights. And the reason they dealt with human rights was basically because the United States wanted to uh, destroy the USSR. They didn't like the fact that the USSR was united and that they had an alternate approach to, to economics, and so they wanted to destroy it. So they used the uh, United Nations on human rights. That issue of human rights isn't as significant anymore simply because uh, the USSR is no longer there. It's just Russia and, and the other states. And so now they're trying to reorganize uh, the world according to the World Trade Organization. WTO is more important now than the United Nations. Human rights issues aren't as significant as they were 10 years ago. Now it's trade. What they want to do is develop mono, uh, monopolies around the world. And one of the biggest stumbling blocks of developing that, especially with regard to natural resources, is the environmental movement, is sustainable development issues that are uh, out there. And uh, the WTO, will, what they're trying to do is stratify it in terms of creating a strong organization that, that can crush the other ones, and the, the economic and the sustainable development ones. And that's what I raise here, simply indigenous rights as a proprietary interest because, you know, any capital is supposed to own what they sell. They're not supposed to be selling stolen goods. And that's how I raise the fact that Canada is participating. It's one of the, the G8 it's out there selling stolen goods because it doesn't have any legitimate agreements with the, the interior nations of British Columbia, nor any nation in British Columbia. So a lot of the products like the British Columbia, 70% of all the forest products come to the United States for sale. That's how come I'm interested in talking about things like an international market campaign that would involve a boycott of BC forest products to be sold in, 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 in uh, the United States. Because if we can achieve that, then the government will sit down and start negotiating this whole question of sustainable development. Up to that point, they, they don't care because we're in court. Like today, I, I'm, I, my lawyers are in Vernon, or in Kelowna, in court. My counsel are down there because we're talking about logging issues. And we've been in court uh, for the last several months over issues regarding forest issues. And uh, they, they'll ignore it. They'd like to get us into court because they know in court it takes... Uh, it's a two-year waiting list just to get on a, a Supreme Court uh, list, and then it takes you 12 to 14 years uh, to get through the Supreme Court itself. So they're looking at, uh, you know, uh, 12 to 16 years maybe in terms of uh, time. 
that they can continue to, to exploit the, the natural resources, destroy the animals, destroy the livelihood of our people. And they like that, and it costs us money. But we're out there, we're taking political action. There's questions, we've had roadblocks in which we've stopped uh, Ainsworth Logging Company. Uh, we wound up in court and that, we won an injunction. We went out and logged without a provincial uh, permit and uh, we got hauled into court for that and uh, they put an injunction against us. We're in all kinds of legal scraps with the government uh, in terms of jurisdiction over forest resources and the purpose that we're looking at is to is to build indigenous authority and jurisdiction and force, not on the reservations, this is all out in so-called what you'd call here state or federal lands, you know, what we call crown lands out there. Like 85% uh, of pro the province of British Columbia is crown land. You know, but only about 15% are held under fee simple or the highest sort of private individual proprietary interest that you can have. So the thing is that we're talking about a fairly big chunk of the, the forest resources in, in this whole north uh, west of, uh, of North America. And uh, we're talking about if we can establish sustainable development in that area that we're talking about, it will have a dramatic impact. But it's all hooked into the marketplace. It's all hooked into what's happening at WTO uh, and what Canada's doing there. Because if they can get away with it, if they can get to monopolize the authority to crush the environmental movement, then you're going to see the kind of devastation that has taken place. Like I, when I was in Germany, <clears throat> I went up to Lübeck uh, <clears throat> in northern Germany and uh, met with a, a man who was uh, managing the forest resources for this community. And he went through the history of European experience with regard to forests, you know. And he said at one time Germany was 90% forest way back in the 1500s or something. Uh, and he said it, it wound up uh, going down to about 2%. And now they're back up to about 10%. And you and he's seen the trees there, and we're going through the forest and walking through the forest. And on one side they'd have Douglas fir and red oak, some of the the, the uh, plantation type forest that they developed in, in in that particular little spot. And he was explaining the the economics of uh, overcutting. He said, the, in terms of reforesting that area, he said all of the imported uh, plants that he brought in, or that were brought in like hundreds of years ago, and these things are big now, he said, a lot of them got destroyed simply because uh, they didn't have the root base, they, didn't, they weren't indigenous and local to the area. And he said, we spend more money taking care of those uh, plantation trees than the money that we're going to get when we actually log them. He said, really, the, the real trees that should be growing there, and they had areas like that, are the indigenous trees. He said, because you don't need to spend any money taking care of them. When you sell them, they're actually value, they're more valuable than the, than, than the plantation trees. And uh, when I explained some of the kinds of things the, the Ministry of Forests of British Columbia were doing in, in the province, he would actually break out laughing because he found it so idiotic and there seems to be some kind of a breakdown in communication between white people, white people in North America and white people in Europe. I think they better get together and start figuring out that you can't rape and pillage North America like you raped and pillaged Europe. And Europeans are saying that to us over here too because there was a lot of support for what we were doing over there saying that the, the, the white people over there have to listen to you indigenous people because they're going to destroy it. And in our area, we call the white people the small children of the land because they have no memory of the land because they never came from here. They never used the medicines and they never took things from the land. So they have no memory, They're like children are running around destroying it. Sure, you can buy a nice truck and all these other nice things by destroying trees, but what is the price you really pay for that truck in the final analysis? You know, we need to really start thinking about that because uh, I think one of the things is that <clears throat> when you're looking at the, the ecology like that, you need to look at the traditional knowledge as really the old people, and that's what our story is. Like the white people are, are the young children of the land, and the elders have the old knowledge of the land. And somehow we need to marry uh, modern knowledge with, with traditional knowledge so that uh, you can develop a better forest act, and you can start talking about bringing back the, 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 the wealth of the traditional areas 
you know, in one of the tribes in, 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 uh, <clears throat> in, in Canada, basically they have a feast once a year and they set out all the foods in, on, on, in, the, in the area. And, uh, and if there's something missing, they just don't put anything there. And then the elders get up and talk about uh, why is that missing? What, is the, what has been the industrial impact? What has been the impact, not the industrial, what has it been the impact? Why is it not there? And as you start missing more and more things from your table, then you know what the impact of, of, uh, of industrialization is always more than likely the answer of, uh, of harvesting in the forest and stuff like that. And people have to be really concerned about that because we're talking about the future. You know, when we talk about forests in, 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 in North America, we should be talking in terms of 500 years. Not in terms of uh, how many cut blocks are out there, how many truckloads are out there, what's the payment to finning, what's the payment to the bank, and all this kind of stuff that sort of clutters that and messes up. You know, what we're 